Hello, Assalamualaikum. Me, Dr. Ruxana Ahmed, Associate Professor of Pediatrics. I have passed my FCPS in 2018, and in 2021, I have passed MSCPCH Part 1 and Part 2, and now candidate for clinical exam. Mm, before starting the class, um, now everyone here, will you please introduce yourself by telling your name and working place, just for a introduction. I'm Dr. Ranuma Amin. Currently, I'm uh, working as medical officer in Sheikh Russell <coughs> Gastrolibur Institute and Hospital. Okay. Someone else? I'm Dr. Sophie from Uganda. Hello. Hello. Okay. Then let's start our class. First of Hello. all, Dr. Roxana, madam, uh, just sorry for uh, interruption. Actually, we have the 25 candidates in your batch. But we are saying only three candidates at now. So after 10 or 15 minutes, they will come. So approximately 10 to 15 candidates uh, uh, present in live session. Maybe some okay. of the, uh, there are some personal uh, activities are like that. So they are not available at this moment. So they watch the lectures after in our e-learning platform after the session. So, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, before starting, our today's topics is neonatology and pediatric surgery. It consists two class. Now, today is the first class of neonatology as well as the pediatric surgery part one. Before starting our uh, presentation, uh, we have to know for a better uh, preparation, it is essential about the syllabus which is provided by the RCPCH. What we have to learn or what is the syllabus of neonatology? What is the topics are, what is the hot topics for MSCPCS part one? These are the topics uh, I'm reading is, uh, these are normal physiological process, effects of antenatal and perinatal events, antenatal diagnosis of neonatal tube defect, prematurity, neonatal jaundice, base feeding, newborn screening, common minor congenital anomaly, Brain injury, respiratory disorder, necrotizing enterocolitis, ventilation support. And the, now the question is, what is the research or what are the research that are recommended by RCPCH for their part one task and the POP? These are the some books which is, are recommended by RCPCH. These are the clinical cases for MSCPCH theory and science and clinical cases for MSCPCH, Foundation of Practice, as well as the main books are the Illustrated Textbook and the Science of Pediatrics. And for neonatology, we have to read some hot topics from neonatal guideline. And for theory and science, the case number 5, 36, 37, and 38 is related to neonatology. And from for Foundation of Practice, Case number 30, 36, and 40 is related to neonatology. Okay. Now, first, it starts our first topics. According to our syllabus, and by my presentation, I will uh, inshallah try to cover that hot topics from the books of illustrated textbook, science of pediatrics, as well as the clinical cases books for POP and TAS and the neonatal guidance. First of all, the physiological process. This is fetal circulation. First of all, you will see a video. But before this video, I will demonstrate how the process of fetal circulation occurs. Before birth, oxygenated blood from placenta comes through single umbilical vein. This is the oxygenated blood. Comes from placenta through single umbilical vein. And half of this oxygenated blood passes through the liver. And the rest half goes to the ductus venosus. 
From ductus venosus, it enters into the inferior vena cava. And I repeat, these bloods are oxygenated. Then this oxygenated blood from inferior vena cava directly, directly come to the right atria. This oxygenated blood, then as it is oxygenated, it doesn't need to go to lungs. So this oxygenated blood from the right atrium comes to, through the foramen ovale, it comes to the left atrium. And from left atrium, the ventricle, and from left ventricle through aorta, it supplies the upper half of the body, mainly the upper half of the body. Am I clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Then, blood from the lower half of the body passes through this way. But blood from the upper half of the body, the deoxygenated blood, I repeat, deoxygenated blood from the upper part of the body comes through the superior vena cava. And as I said, that it is deoxygenated. Then it comes to right atrium. As it is deoxygenated, it comes then by, uh, by tricuspid bulb, it comes to right ventricle. From right ventricle, it enters the pulmonary artery. But why it will go? Lungs. But the lungs is filled with fluid. And there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance in uterus. For this reason, blood cannot enter the lungs. So from pulmonary artery, this blood goes to ductus arteriosus and enters into the descending aorta. From descending aorta, this blood passes through the two umbilical artery for oxygenation comes to this placenta. Am I clear so far? Okay, first of all, then we will see this video. Video of the sound line on a mind. Okay, I'm telling that as this oxygenated blood comes from the placenta through the umbilical vein, half of this blood goes to the liver, rest half of the blood directly passes to the ductus venosus. From ductus venosus, it enters the inferior vena cava. From inferior vena cava, this oxygenated blood comes to the right atrium. From right atrium through foramen ovale comes to the left atrium. From left atrium, it comes to the left ventricle. From left, from left ventricle, it passes through the in uh, passes through the aorta. From aorta, most of this blood, this oxygenated blood, supplies the upper half of the body. But blood, deoxygenated blood from the upper half of the body comes to the superior vena cava. As the blood is deoxygenated, it comes to the right atrium. From right atrium, by the tricuspid valve, it enters the right ventricle. From right ventricle to pulmonary artery, to ductus venosa, ductus arteriosus, descending aorta, through to umbilical artery, it comes to the placenta for oxygenation. Let's see this diagram. It also helps us for our better understanding. See, this is placenta. Red for oxygenated blood and blue for the deoxygenated blood. From the placenta, deoxygenated blood, I repeat, oxygenated blood from placenta comes via ductus venosus to right atrium. From right atrium, this blood, foramen ovale, comes to the right left atrium. From left atrium, left ventricle, left ventricle, by aorta, it supplies the upper half of the body. Now the deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood from upper half and some from the lower half of the body, deoxygenated blood comes to the right atrium. From right atrium, as it is deoxygenated for oxygenation, it comes to the right ventricle and then comes to the pulmonary artery. But then where usually after birth, it goes to the lungs. But in the interuterine life, the lungs is filled with water, fluid. 
So, and there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So from pulmonary artery, it directly enters the ductus arteriosus. From ductus arteriosus through descending thoracic aorta, it enters via two pulmonary artery into the placenta for oxygenation. Are you clear? Yes. Thank you. Now, some important slides from sense of pediatrics. Only this, only 7% of combined this circulation enters the lungs. And the right ventricle is the, as we know, the right ventricle is the dominant ventricle ejecting 66% of combined ventricular output. This is from science of pediatrics. Here, three lines are important. These are the part of fetal circulation with lowest vascular resistance, the part of fetal circulation with highest oxygenation, the part of fetal circulation with highest vascular resistance. Here, the answer is the part of fetal circulation which has the lowest vascular resistance is placenta. The part of fetal circulation which has the highest vascular resistance it is the umbilical artery and umbilical vein has the highest oxygenation. So why the ductus arteriosus is opened in the fetus? Before birth, why it is open? It is open by the two factors, low oxygen tension and also by the prostaglandin E2 causes the dilating effect of ductus arteriosus. From where this prostaglandin E2 comes from? It comes from placenta. Are you clear about the fetal circulation? Yes, science of pediatrics said, but the phone page stick out to a pinch of a lamb to make sure the head and it could have been put up. Just a page to a page a line to important. The important line she can be I made a group share page number to the I made a group with the page number to Any question regarding fetal circulation? Are you clear about the conception of fetal circulation? Yes, miss. Okay. Now comes to our next physiology. This is fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin, the, uh, the hemoglobin in the fetal is called the fetal hemoglobin. It made up of two alpha and two gamma chain. By third trimester, fetal starts to produce hemoglobin A. That means the adult hemoglobin. At birth, there is 80% of fetal hemoglobin and 20% of hemoglobin A. There is a special characteristic of fetal hemoglobin. That is, the fetal hemoglobin has gamma chain. This gamma chain has reduced affinity for 2,3 DGP. What is the function of 2,3-DGP? 2,3-DGP facilitates the oxygen release at tissue level. It facilitates oxygen release to tissue level. As gamma chain has reduced affinity for 2,3-DGP, so it binds with oxygen tightly. So it makes easier for a fetus to carry oxygenated blood easily from maternal circulation. Are you clear about it? Okay. The hemoglobin of fetus is mainly fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin made up of two alpha and two gamma chain. At third trimester, fetal starts to synthesize the adult hemoglobin. Adult hemoglobin is made up of two alpha and two beta chain. So 
And at birth, there is 80% of fetal hemoglobin and 20% of adult hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin has a special characteristics so that it has gamma chain. This gamma chain has reduced affinity for 2,3-DGP. What is the function of 2,3-DGP? 2,3-DGP facilitates oxygen release at tissue level. As the fetal hemoglobin has reduced affinity for 2,3-DGP, so it tightly binds the oxygen. And this property, oxygen binding property, makes fetus easier to carry oxygenated blood from maternal circulation through the placenta into the fetal body. Now you, can I repeat it? No, oh, ma'am, it's fine now. No, thank you. This slide shows that the same word that he, fetal hemoglobin has to alpha and to gamma chain and to gamma chain, the gamma chain has the reduced affinity for 2,3-DGP. And reduced 2, 3 D, for this property to reduce 2,3-DGP, fetal hemoglobin shifted the oxyhemoglobin curve to the left side. Now we'll discuss regarding oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. First of all, when we fix breath air, this air contains 21% of oxygen. This oxygen comes to the lung. In the lung, it makes merge with arterial blood, this oxygen. And by, via the hemoglobin, it is carried to this oxygen is carried to the tissue. From the tissue after metabolism, the byproduct carbon dioxide is come and it binds to the hemoglobin, comes to the venous blood, comes to the lungs, and the carbon dioxide is washed out through the lung. Okay, then we will give this name. What is the name in the different situation of this oxygen? This oxygen is called FiO2. In the lungs, this oxygen is known as P A O 2. A for alveolar oxygen. And in arterial blood, it is known as P A small a O 2. And this hemoglobin is oxygenated hemoglobin. Is a Passing the saturation of hemoglobin. So, this and this carbon dioxide is carbomino hemoglobin. Okay. Then we will discuss about the oxyhemoglobin curve. This is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. This curve has two axes, x-axis and the y-axis. X-axis for partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. So I mentioned the, in the previous slide about the PaO2. And the y-axis represent the percentage saturation, SaO2. This curve has two parts. At the, at the lungs, this oxygenated blood leave the alveoli and jumps into the hemoglobin to bind with oxyhemoglobin. So as can we see that there is increase of saturation and there is increased binding. And it occurs in the lungs. And at the tissue level, oxygen leaves the blood and the hemophore, this region, this hemoglobin enters into the cell. So oxygen is releases. This is, un, it is unloading and this is part is loading of oxygen. And in this part at the tissue level, see, as the SAO2 is decreased and then the binding of the release of oxygen in the tissue, this part. And in this part where the lungs, there is high SAO2 and there is increased partial pressure of oxygen. 
Am I clear in this slide? Yes. Okay. Dr. Rehan, you have to use the person? Yes, my dog. Okay. Next. This is the when the carp is shifted to the right side. See, when the carp is shifted to the right side, that means the percentage of oxygen binding with hemoglobin is decreased. And percentage and the partial pressure of oxygen is decreased. That means the oxygen is unloading from the hemoglobin. So it occurs in the tissue level. And the, when the, this curve is turns to the left side, turns to the left side, that means that there is increase of partial pressure of oxygen and increase of percentage saturation. Y axis is increased and as well X, the X axis. For this reason, there is increased binding of oxygen with hemoglobin. So there's some condition when the carp is turns to the right side. And some condition when the uh, carp is turns to the left side. So when it turns to the right side, in the right side, we have to remember that when it turns to the right side, that means at the tissue level. We, when it occurs, it occurs in this temperature, increase hydrogen and concentration, that means decrease pH, that, that means acidosis, increase 2, 3 DGP, increase height, chronic anemia, hemoglobin is pregnancy. This condition causes the carb turns to the right side. And there's some condition, it's important topics, for example, when the carb, what are the situation when the carb is turns to the left side? Just we just inverse the condition, decrease temperature, decrease hydrogen ion, that means the alkalosis, decrease 2, 3 DGP. Look, 2, 3 DGP is when decreases, the carb is turns to the left side. That means there is increased binding with oxygen. That means the fetal hemoglobin. So fetal hemoglobin can turn the oxyhemoglobin carb to the left side. Another carboxyhemoglobin and carbon monoxide poisoning causes the carb to the turn to the left side. Are you clear? How oxygen hemoglobin carb is turns to the right, to the left? Dr. Sondi Bodo, are you understanding us? Are you following us? Hi, madam. Okay. Dr. Rehunima, can I proceed? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me why hemoglobin F turns the oxyhemoglobin curve to the left side? Why? Hemoglobin A has less affinity to the 2 3 DPG. Yes. So is bind more oxygen. Yes. Uh, so it uh, moves the carb to the left. Yes. More oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin. So the, this is increasing. For this region, it turns to the from this, it turns to the left side. Thank you. Okay, this is this all about the fetal hemoglobin. And now the changes at birth. Changes at the birth occurs following the birth, there is lung expand. When the lung is expand, the lung is expand. At the, uh, at the interuterine left, the lungs is like collapse. Following birth, the lungs is expand. For this reason, the pulmonary vascular resistance is fall down. When the pulmonary resistance is fall down, then increased blood goes to the lung. This blood then comes to the left atrium, and then this flow pushes the closest of the foramen oval. And at the same time, umbilical cord is clamped. 
it increases the systemic vascular resistance. And as the umbilical cord is clump, clump, no prostaglandin E2 is come from the placenta. And so the ductus arteriosus will be closed. This occurs simultaneously after birth, changes at birth. Are you clear about this three point? How the foramen ovale is closed? How the patent ductus arteriosus is closed? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Dr. Paramita Sharkar. Are you clear about the topic? Ji, yes, ma'am. Okay. This is, look at this picture. In this picture, after the delivery, we can see that the, um, the muscle layer is thin. But in the intrauterine life, the muscle layer is thick. But the following the birth, the muscle layer becomes thinner and there is decreased pulmonary resistance. But when any situation during or after the birth that causes hypoxia to the newborn, then this pulmonary vascular will remain the thick layer. That means there will be persistence of pulmonary hypertension. There are some conditions that causes persistent pulmonary hypertension. These are perinatal asphyxia, RDS, sepsis, mucinum patient syndrome, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, maternal use of NSI, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, hypoxia, hypothermia, and acidosis. Now we will solve the case number task, case number five. And uh, Dr. Rehnuma, will you answer this question? Which is the best description of the fetal circulation in newborn? Blood flows through foramen ovale from left atrium to right atrium. Is it correct or not? Blood flows from foramen ovale from left atrium to right atrium. Is it correct? Correct, yes. How? No, madam. Foramen ovale. Blood comes from the this Right to left. Right to left. Right to left. Right to left. Yes. Okay. In fetus, there is two umbilical artery and one umbilical vein. Is it correct or wrong? Yes. Very good. Dr. Paramita Shortcut. Over 90% of blood bypass the liver by the ductus venosus. No. 90%. Whenever Dr. Yasmin Akhtar. Yes, ma'am. Please solve this question. The umbilical artery carries oxygenated blood from placenta to fetus. Is it right or wrong? Oxygenated blood from placenta to fetus. Umbilical artery carries the oxygenated blood from placenta to fetus. False, madam. So who is, uh, which artery carries? So which vessel carries this oxygenated blood from placenta to? Umbilical vein. Very good. The patency of uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paramita Shortcut. The patency of the ductus arteriosus is maintained by the vasodilating effect of prostaglandin G2. E2. E2, postagalin E2, homina. Yes, thank you. Okay, now we'll try to solve this problem also. Which stimuli would cause the pulmonary artery to constrict and leads to increase pulmonary vascular resistance? 
ডক্টর ইয়াসমিন আপনি বলেন হিমোগ্লোবিন <laughs> Two three DGP levels are high in fetal hemoglobin as compared to adult hemoglobin. Is it correct? No, madam. Yes, because fetal hemoglobin has reduced yes. affinity to two three DGP. Is it also shift the oxyhemoglobin curve to right side? Is it correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, the affinity of adult hemoglobin towards oxygen is greater. then the hemoglobin f the affinity of adult hemoglobin is more to oxygen than fetal hemoglobin is it correct no madam yes oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for hemoglobin f is shifted to the left is compared to the adult hemoglobin is it right or wrong right madam right okay the shift from fetal hemoglobin to hemoglobin a happens during adolescence now madam eta 3 mash e 6 month is from the third trimester and at birth there is 80% of fetal hemoglobin and 20% of hemoglobin a at 3 to 6 months then most of the hemoglobin becomes to hemoglobin a and some portion becomes to remains as hemoglobin a this is a recall question dr rehnima will you please answer it fetal hemoglobin compared to hemoglobin adult hemoglobin which one of the following is true Let's check it. High affinity to fetal hemoglobin has high affinity for oxygen. True, low, two, three DGP and shifted to left. Okay. Shifted to left. Right. Shifted to right. Hey, take on the whole thing. Why did you take us? It's a whole list of what the kids. important topics but when you read through this whole top whole chapter or whole case then you will better understand and if you have any confusion please tell me another topic maternal drugs affecting unit this is a question from science of pediatrics a child with anomal hypoplasia and discoloration of the teeth which drugs that mother contains can causes the newborn baby's this condition enamel hypoplasia and discoloration of teeth another problem is babies with short or missing limb that means phacomalia which drugs that mother takes during her pregnancy will cause this condition to newborn baby and infant tetracycline yes tetracycline and the second one thalidomide thalidomide and 
Okay. An infant with Ibsen anomaly, which ducks of mother that taken? Ibsen anomaly. No problem. Lithium. Yes, thank you. This is discharged also from science of pediatrics. Important ducks, I have marked it. Antipsychotic lithium causes the Ibsen anomaly. Thylidomide causes the phacomalia, that means short limb, absent auricles, deafness. Antimicrobials, tetracycline causes the tooth enamel hypoplasia, yellow staining of the teeth. And streptomycin, if mother takes during her pregnancy, it will, it can cause sensory neural deafness. Vitamin A analog causes the craniofacial anomaly. And this stretch, I think um, it's also important. I have taken it from the illustrated test book. It's very important book because I have found that um, this illustrated textbooks of pediatrics suggested by RCPCH, here all the topics that are written in the syllabus of RCPCH for MRCPCH part one, they write this the book according to this syllabus. So, I think this book is also helpful for you. And uh, here, the anticonvulsant drugs causes such as the carbamazepine, valproic acid, hydrantoin, such as the phenytoin, can cause the hydrantoin syndrome. Lithium causes the congenital heart disease, Ibsen anomaly. Selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, SSRI, causes persistent pulmonary hypertension. Tetracyclines cause enamel hypoplasia. Thylidomide causes the shortening of the limb. And important is fetal alcohol syndrome. And there is this uh, touchy point is that there is a smooth filter and short upper limb. Along with baby have the microcephaly and congenital heart disease and baby will be IUGA. I have taken this from the science of pediatrics. Every box, most of the boxes of science of pediatrics book is very much important. Okay, this is a recall question. Do you know what is recall question? What is fastest question? Dr. Ehnuma, do you know it? What is the recall question and what is fastest question? Is recall holo the basic take a ashpe. Uh, question, question bank at Okay. Another else answer is recall. Yes. Yes. So recall is very much important. Also, past test is important, but most must to read topic is to recall. You have to repeat this regularly because you get an idea about the topics. And past test is a question back. For your better conception, you can go through it, no problem. And by practicing you, you will be more mature. But mandatory is to solve the recall. You will, as much as recall you have solved, then it will make your uh, pathway very much easier. So it's a recall question. Baby was under child protection came with smooth filter and learning disability with thin upper limb. So I have called that, I have um, telling you that the thin upper limb, thin upper limb and smooth filter with heart disease, with microcephaly, these four points are very important regarding fetal alcohol syndrome. And features of opiate withdrawal syndrome, this will be irritability, high pitch cry, hyperactivity, tremor, increased tone, seizure, poor feeding, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, fever, wanging, sneezing. Maternal disease affecting the new net. Just now we have uh, just a conception regarding Maternal dust affecting neonate. Now, maternal disease condition affecting neonate. These are neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia, neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. First of all, neonatal autoimmune. 
neonatal autoimmune. That means mother has any autoimmune disease such as ITP, ACL. Here the interplatelet IgG, G for gravid antibody in the maternal thrombocytopenia can cross the placenta and causes the fetal thrombocytopenia. And in case of neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, here the fetal platelet contains antigen which the mother lacks. The mother develops the antibody which crosses the placenta. Here mother doesn't have any disease, but in case of neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia, mother has autoimmune disease. In this way, you can remember auto, auto. Neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia, mother will be suffering, mother have to be suffering from autoimmune disease such as the ACLE, ITP. So in the uh, clinical picture or in the question paper, we will see that mother platelet count is decreased and fetal uh, and neonatal platelet platelet count is also decreased. This is neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Whereas in case of neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, mother pet platelet will be normal, but neonatal platelet will be low. So this condition is neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. Why neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia occurs? As fetal platelet contains antigen, which the mother doesn't have. So mother develop antibody against that antigen. It passes through the placenta and causes neonatal thrombocytopenia. Am I clear up to this point? What is neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia? What is neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia? Dr. Paramita, are you getting me? Madam, are you going to tell me about Okay. Auto, auto. Mother has any autoimmune disease. Child will suffer from neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia. If mother has no autoimmune disease, but in the blood picture, we can find that neonatal platelet count is decreased. Then it will be neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. As the fetal platelet contains antigen, which mother doesn't have. So mother will develop, mother circulation will develop antibody against the antigen. This antibody crosses the placenta and causes neonatal thrombocytopenia. Are you clear now? Ji ma'am, who's the first thing? Okay, solve this question. And it is a recall question. Uh, one newborn baby weighed 3.2 kg concern regarding her increasing increase PTG and spleen and liver is one centimeter. Mother platelet is 3,25. Mother platelet is normal, 3,25,000. But the baby has PTG purpura. So mother doesn't have any autoimmune disease. If mother had autoimmune disease such as ACLE or ITP, the platelet count will be decreased. But here the platelet count is normal. So it will be neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. The question number three, and here there is also PTG purpura, but the mother platelet is only 95,000. So mother may be suffering from any kind of autoimmune disease such as ITP, ACLE. For this reason, baby develops neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Are you clear now? Yes, ma'am. Can I proceed further? Yes, ma'am, proceed. Thank you. This chart also from the science of pediatrics and it is important. For which points are important here? In congenital rubella, there will be every agents that is the glaucoma, cataract, chorioretinitis, macroophthalmia. In CNS, there in CNS there will be macrocephaly, cardiac disease, as we all know this, there will be patent ductus arteries, PDA, pulmonary stenosis, and sensory hearing, sensory neural hearing loss, and there will be hepatosplenomegaly. In case of cytomegaly, there will be chorioretinitis, 
calcification. In case of cytomegalovirus, there will be calcification around the ventricle, periventricular calcification. And in heart, there is no congenital heart disease in case of usually. There is no congenital heart disease in congenital cytomegaloviral infection. And there will be sensory neuronal hearing loss. Hepatosplenomegaly is present. But in case of toxoplasma infection, there is no hepatomegaly. There is no usually cardiac disease. There will be also calcification just like cytomegaloinfection, infection, but the calcification is all around the head, not the specific the periventricular region. If the calcification is around the periventricular region, it may be cytomegaloinfection. infection, okay? But in uh, both rubella and cytomegalo had hepatosplenomegaly, but in toxoplasma, there is no hepatosplenomegaly. And uh, in case of toxoplasma infection, there will be cataract, macroophthalmia, chorioreginitis. Okay. This is also a recall question. This baby is a small for gestational age with pulmonary stenosis, absent red reflex. That means there is absent red reflex. That means that there will be cataract and there is pulmonary stenosis. And look at this chart. This just copy and um, this probably gets the idea from this chart. Because in this cytomegalo and toxoplasmosis, there is usually no cardiac defect. So only cardiac defect with cataract is present in the congenital rubella. Mm. Are you clear? Dr. Rehanuma. Yes, madam. Okay. Now, maternal ACL, maternal ACL also affect newborn. It can cause recurrent miscarriage and 0.5 to 1% chance of congenital heart block due to anti row and anti line body. We have solved this recall and then maternal diabetes, it is important. Maternal diabetes, there is three fold increased risk of congenital malformation. Which malformation, congenital heart disease, sacral agenesis, microcolon, and neural tube defect. Sacral agenesis, congenital heart disease, one is in the heart, one is in the back sacral, one is in the microcolon, and another is also in the back, such as the neural tube defect. And it also causes the small for constitutional age, as well as for the macrosomia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, surfactant deficiency, transient hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, polycythemia, jaundice. This is also a recall question. Look, that most common complication of IDM mother, which is the, and among the three, the sacral agenesis, duodenal atresia is not common for a IDM baby. They may suffer from microcolon. Diaphragmatic hernia, no, it is not um, directly linked with IDM, but sacral agenesis is related to IDM baby. Are you clear? Okay. Now, amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is produced by the amnion, fetal urine, and lung secretion. So, any abnormality in fetal urination or lung secretion, lungs development may cause reduced the amniotic fluid level or increase the amniotic fluid level, such as the oligohydroamnion. Oligohydroamnion, oligohydroamnion causes are most of the causes are the idiopathic cause. And when the amniotic fluid volume is reduced, it is uh, oligohydroamnion. And as I mentioned that in case of fetal kidney disease or fetal lung disease can cause the increase uh, amniotic fluid volume or decrease amniotic fluid volume. Now we are reading about the oligohydroamnion. Here, fetal malformations such as the Porter syndrome or obstruction of the renal tract can cause the oligohydroamnion. And what will be the complication if the baby suffers from oligohydroamnion is as there is less amount of fluid. So there will be fetal growth restriction. Poor 
lung maturation. Oligohydramnion is related to poor lung maturation. And it, these two points is important. And what is polyhydramnion? Polyhydramnion is when the immunity fluid is more than the normal level. And the, some new, which is the causes of polyhydramnion? Important cause is anencephaly, neural tube defect. And another are the esophageal atresia, congenital myotonic dystrophy, twin twin transfusion, maternal diabetes. This is a recall question. It probably comes in 2014. A case with oligohydramnion, most common morbid condition. Just I have mentioned, most common is lung hypoplasia. But in case of uh, polyhydramnion, common condition that causes polyhydramnion is anencephaly, esophageal atresia, twin twin transfusion, maternal diabetes. Are you clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Dr. Yasmin, are you clear? Regarding the immunotic fleet. Maternal disease condition that affecting the new maternal drugs. Okay. Now, hydrops fetalis. Hydrops, what is hydrops fetalis? Subcutaneous edema and fluid, at least two of cruel effusion, which may present as cruel effusion, ascites, pericardial effusion. Here, the causes is most important. Infectious cause, parvovirus infection is one of the most important cause. Another cause that causes hydrops fetalis are twin twin transfusion, pseudo maternal hemorrhage, cardiomyopathy, supraventricular tachycardia, diaphragmatic hernia, cystic hygroma. This is a recall question. What is hydrops fetalis? What is the positive organism? Positive organism is parvovirus infection. Now, another important topic is twin twin transfusion or twin baby. First of all, we will read regarding the monozygotic and dizygotic twin. In monozygotic, this page for the monozygotic twin, and I uh, have taken this picture from the science of pediatrics. Look, this monozygotic twin, this have two amnion, one chorion, and one placenta. 66% cases, monozygotic twin may have two amnion, one chorion, and one placenta. But, 30, rest of the 35% of cases, it is also for monozygotic. These have two amnion, two chorion, and two placenta. This reads this explanation in the details. Monozygotic twin is 65% of monozygotic twin may develop from one zygote and have separate amnion. This is the separate amnion. This is the separate amnion. A single chorionic set. Yes, Dr. Yasmin. Okay. And 35% of monozygotic twin develops from one zygote, but they have two identical blastocytes. That means two identical amnion, two chorion, and two separate placenta. This is for monozygotic twin. That means in case of monozygotic twin, most of the cases, 65% of the cases may have two amnion, one chorion, one placenta. Same monochorionic twins may present with two separate amnion, two chorion, two placenta. Whereas the dizygotic twin, this is the dizygotic. They, they have two amnion, two chorion. But sometimes they may have two amnion, single chorion, single placenta. Now, Dr. Rehinuma, will you please answer this question 
dichorionic twins are dizygotic. Is it true or false? Look at this picture. Dichorionic twins are dizygotic, having dichorionic twins. मोनोजैगटिक Two placenta, two chorion. Monozygotic twins have one placenta, one chorion, but two embryo. Monozygotic twin can have one placenta, one placenta, one chorion, and two embryo. Is it true or false? True. ट्रांसफ्यूशन In case of monocorionic twins, the donor is hypovolemic. Donor is hypovolemic. It gives the blood and etc. And this donor has is suffers from growth restriction, oligouria, oligohydramnia. And the recipient has hypervolume. They have high output cardiac failure, polyuria, polyhydramnia. And there will be death. There can be death of the fetus. So, doctor, yes. In twin twin transfusion syndrome, the donor twin is growth restricted. Is it true or false? The donor twin is growth restricted. Donor twin. True. Yes. Can I proceed further? i think it is yes okay then clamping of cord for un uncompromised babies a delay in cord clamping 1 to 3 minutes from the complete delivery of the infant or until the cord stops pulsation is now recommended as a part of active management of the third stage of labor it's very important to note that is the delayed cord clamping is important Effort is the time limit one to three minutes. Okay, doctor. Doctor. Doctor Shundi Bodo, will you please answer this question? A term infant is born after spontaneous vaginal delivery. The baby carries Christ as soon as he is delivered. His breathing and tone are normal. What is the best practice for clamping of the umbilical cord? Which part is the right answer? At least one minute, and baby is transferred to the resuscitation table for observation. After at least one baby, one minute, baby dry and is skin to skin with mother initiated. madam etai hobe no this baby has spontaneous death yes yes this baby is uncompromised this baby is cried oh. after birth so why miss to transfer this baby to the resuscitation table 
this baby is already cried so we at after, yes after at this one minute baby is dried and skin to skin with mother is initiated